no end goal, man. The end goal is to keep playing everything. So every area of my life, I just want to keep, I, I know that there's a, a vision on all of them of where I'm heading that is in unachievable, right? There's no outcome mm-hmm. with any of it. Because if I've learned anything, it's that reaching an outcome is not the goal. It's to enjoy the journey of Absolutely. pursuing that. So there's no end goal. The, the end goal is to wake up every morning excited to build and uh, pursue that vision and mission and uh, enjoy every step along the way. Because Yeah, and have fun. Have fun. fun. You're, you're have the, to, have, you're, have fun. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to yet another episode of uh, the Undefeated Underdogs podcast. I'm your host, Sharad. Today, I have a very special guest, a good friend of mine who I kind of like, you know, get inspired a lot from his Twitter threads, the way he writes things and the way he actually moves, like, you know, just in general, as a human being, being kind, uh, a giver, uh, who who actually kind of, kind of like talks a lot about the values he believe in at the same time, the habits he, he form. He's none other than Dickie Bush. Dickie Bush, welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? Sure. Thanks for having me, man. I'm having a tremendous morning and just a big shout out to you for what you've done with this podcast. The guests, I'm honored to be with some of these others that you've had, Jack and David and all them. So loving what you're doing with the pod and, and thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a delight. Always a delight to talk to you. A fun story. Dickie and I, we connected back in 2020, if I'm not wrong, when I was, you know, in my maker journey and founder journey, and he was just exploring the digital side of things. Uh, and he and I, we connected through shout out one of the products I've built and we instantly clicked. And there is something about Dickie that I really, uh, you know, uh, kind of like fascinates me about is that his honesty and his kind of like your, your thorough uh, work on people, right? Like you, you do your research and you talk, you know, what you know. So love, love, love those conversations always. And yeah, for, for folks who don't know Dickie Bush, just let me give you guys a brief intro. Dickie is a, Dickie is a writer, uh, a, a trader who turned into like a digital marketer, a digital creator uh, who used to work at Black Trade, if I'm not wrong, Blackjack. Sorry. Black Rock. Yeah, yeah. It's just an asset Rock. manager yeah. hedge fund. Mm-hmm. I know, right? Like, world so weird. Like, you, where you, what you're doing is completely different from what you did a couple of years ago. So, uh, he, he, he is the captain for this amazing community called Ship Thirty for Thirty, where they teach how to build a habit of writing. You know, in thirty days. And I love the community. I've been following you guys for a while. You guys are like, you know, killer rockstar community you've built. And he also is a co-founder of Type Dream, uh, Type Share, Type Share a platform where you can seamlessly write like essays, like on a, on a, on a, on a next level. And you can share it on Twitter. You can share it like in your blog posts and whatnot. And I love the way you build uh type shit as well. It's such a, such an amazing platform for writers. And yeah, Dick is like amazing uh, writer himself. Like I said before, he, one, so many of his threads were bookmarked in my bookmarks. And I often refer to him, uh, quite often, like his methods and whatnot. So uh, I'm so stoked for this conversation. We have have some questions right off the bat. I have I have a question for you, Dicky, which is where did you where did you find the interest of writing? You know, is is that your hobby? Who influenced you in your like? Who's your early early childhood hero? So who inspired me to start writing? It's a great story of I hated writing in college. So I studied math and computer science at Princeton because my freshman English class was my least favorite class I took. And I hated the way they taught. I did not like the teacher. I didn't get a good grade, which probably had something to do with my interpretation of the course. Um, I didn't like that if you wrote five pages for a four page paper that you got bonus points. That never made sense to me. And so Mm. I spent a lot of my college career avoiding writing as much as possible. And it wasn't until I started working at BlackRock where in my first couple months, I quickly realized that the people who held the most power, whose ideas were the most respected, who were really the Mm -hmm. most respected people at the firm were the ones who were publishing these highly educational, 
dense, crisply written emails on a consistent, mm -hmm. regular basis. And so mm -hmm. before I even started writing on the internet in January of 2020, I was writing these internal memos um, mm -hmm. as a way to clarify my own thinking, as a way to learn. And so that was my first inspiration. But then I realized, okay, I'm putting on all this work, but there's only a handful of people seeing it. Why wouldn't I right. start to put these ideas out on the internet where everyone can see them? And right. so that launched me into starting a newsletter and starting my own blog in January of 2020, which for the first nine months was a complete waste of time, frustratingly <laughs> slow growth, following the right. conventional playbook, um, right. writing a weekly blog post that I would edit for hours, crafting every word, waiting, you know, trying to be as perfect as possible. And then I hit publish and I'd get 10 readers and like five of them were my mom refreshing the page. So, uh, that <laughs> was my your mom. I know, I know she's, yes. I know she's your biggest fan and I really admire her for being the, the supporter who instilled the belief in you when you get, I, I know you, you and I've had conversations about your mom. Like, I don't know if you remember you, you're telling me about her, like pushing you, like to pursue your own dream, like, which is writing right at that point in 2020. And she's the one who's like, like I said before, she's the one who's like refresh and kind of give you feedback on what, what works and what, what not, not. And I think, uh, love her, you know, shout out to her. Yeah, no, she's been part of every ship 30 cohort, which I'm sure we'll talk about ship 30 a little bit and how yep, my yep. painful first nine months led to that journey. But yeah, she's my number one supporter, my number one critic, my number one source of feedback. So, and she's on Twitter now. She's, I, I think she's at yep. Nikki's underscore mom. Um, been writing <laughs> with a lot of the cohorts and, and is kind of a fan favorite with everyone when she jumps in the live chat and things like that. So it's been fun to have her Love along that. the journey. Love that. So you, you talked about the converse, con conventional way of doing things in the early days. Uh, what are the unconventional ways you did the, after the nine months? What's something like you tried that, that actually worked and you stick to it till now? So at nine months, I was ready to give up entirely. I said, oh, I gave this a good whirl. I wrote a handful mm -hmm. of things. I was pretty consistent. I was following in that weekly playbook. But I said, okay, I'm going to give up entirely, but not until I get all these ideas that I have in this backlog um, out of my head and onto the page. And so mm -hmm. what I did was go on a 30-day thread writing challenge in October of 2020, where every morning mm -hmm. I'd wake up, I'd go for a walk, I'd listen to a podcast, I'd think about the ideas I learned, then I'd go through my whole day at BlackRock, and then in the evening, I'd write a thread. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this for 30 days where I'm going to publish in a social environment instead of on my blog that still no one knew existed. But I'm going to put it on Twitter. I'm going to engage with people who I'm writing the thread about, send it their way. And if after 30 days, this doesn't work, I gave it my all. I gave it my best. I'm done. And mm. I still remember day 28. So I'm 27 days in. I'm having fun. Things are going okay. Some, some days better mm -hmm. than others. And day 28, I had published on something that got zero likes, zero comments, zero retweets. It was basically like it didn't exist. And I said, all mm. right, that's a signal. That's it. I'm right. done. Enough, enough. But I wasn't yeah. one to, I wasn't one to give up and quit. Uh, and so I said, mm. all right, I'll, I'll finish my 29th and 30th. And so the next day, 6 p.m. came around. I had published on the thread that I whipped up in an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I turned my computer off. Woke up the next morning. It went viral. Naval had retweeted it. Balaji had retweeted it. It was about Balaji and his thought process. And mm. to this day, still one of my most viral threads. I think I had, I went to bed with 400 followers and like 100 newsletter subscribers. And granted, this was after nine months. And right. I woke up the next right. morning to, I think, 2,000 followers and 700 newsletter subscribers. So I like to say wow. it took me nine months wow. to get to 100 and 12 hours to get to 500 or 700 or wherever I got to. But the lesson right. was... I had no clue what was going to work. I just had to keep hmm. putting things out there. And it only took a month for me to figure out some things that worked. But if I had followed the conventional playbook of a weekly blog post that no one knew existed, I wasn't getting any feedback. I, I didn't have, I wasn't testing ideas well. That was mm -hmm. never going to lead to any kind of success. So that was the un unconventional playbook. But I think we've done a good job educating people on this new playbook, which is figure out the ideas that you want to write about validate them on Twitter, put them out there, expand the ones that reach a, a, a level of interest with readers and that you were also interested in writing and then kind of double down on that feedback loop. I love that. I love that. And 
why 30 days? If I'm like, you know, wanted to dive deeper, you, you, you should have said, let's do it for a week or let's do it for two weeks. Why specifically like 30 days? What's, what's, what's the significance behind that? Because no the reason sig- I was asking yeah. is that you did 30 days and that's like, that's, that's what you ended up with, which is ship 30 for 30. You, 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 that's the home pro premise. Like you, you teach people how to build a habit in 30 days. Yeah, I guess ship 10 for 10 didn't sound as good. And I just took 30 <laughs> a month. There's no, no secret formula behind that one. Uh, just 30 days. That I knew that was enough for me that it was challenging, right. but it was realistic to stick to. It was going to take a lot of effort. I'd be tired by the end, which I was. And right. uh, I knew that if I did it for 30 days, the answer would take care of itself. I'd get better mm. or I'd hate it so much that I'd give up. And that's what happens to a lot of writers in ship 30 is they either realize hey, this is exactly what I want to do for the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, right on the mm-hmm. internet, share my ideas, attract like-minded people, or I accelerated the decision of this isn't for me. I wrote for 15 right. days. It wasn't that fun. I didn't really like it, but at least I didn't wait 10 years to make a decision right. and try something that I got the answer to in two weeks. And so it's really, right. there's upside either way. You're either going to love it or you're going to find out you don't. But either way, right. it's better than saying someday I'll start writing. Right. No, I, yeah, absolutely right. I think a couple of points I want to like, you know, touch on. One is, yeah, 30 days is actually kind of like a right period. It's not too long and it's not too short where you kind of like see immediate results or expect like things to work, right? You give yourself enough room to like wiggle, experiment and test. And I love, I love, of course, ship, ship 30 for 30 is like perfect. Uh, as a name and the other thing you mentioned which is also is very important for listeners is that it's all about like trying different things in like you said you don't know what what works and the things that work for you might not work for someone else that's why every every path is unconventional in its own way like everybody's chasing their own path right uh i love that so all, all good, like 30 days. And what, what was like the intention behind starting ship 30 for 30? Is it like right after 30 days after the thread went viral? Like when did you decide like, you know what, let me actually go ahead and, and teach uh, people about like the same writing process I went through for the last 30 days. So for me, it was, I was so tired after that 30 days that I knew I needed some accountability if I was going to keep writing. So I was very selfishly mm-hmm. starting a community to solve my own problem of, I need help. So I put out a tweet to my, I think, thousand-ish followers at the time, who'd be interested in joining me for a 30-day writing challenge? It's kind of a legendary tweet at this point that I love to pull up to show people that you don't need a huge audience to build things. Right. You don't need a perfect plan. You just need to get started because right. the response to that tweet was overwhelming. I had hundreds of replies. Mm. And so I, I knew I couldn't do that, uh, like run a community with that many people, especially for free. So the right. original Ship 30 cohort was $50 because I was so terrified to charge money for something. And mm. you got your money back if you completed all 30 days. So here I am like balancing a spreadsheet with <laughs> everyone who's paid and everyone's PayPal email and whether they wrote every day and whether I had an interview with them and all these different things. Um, so right. that was the original cohort was just us in a slack channel like we we look like celebrities posting public apologies via the notes app because we were just writing up an idea and sharing the screenshot on twitter right Right. Um, i remember yeah and so it started as a solution to my own problem but i quickly realized hey and this is a a broader takeaway for people is that the problems you've solved in the last nine months so for me that was i identified this problem of I'd started to write and I didn't enjoy it because I didn't have enough people around me providing accountability, support, feedback that I knew there needed to be a solution here. And so I held Mm -hmm. 50, five, zero one-on-one interviews with people from that original ship 30 cohort asking them, why'd you join? What are you looking to get out of this? What could have been better? What could we improve? What was your favorite part? Least favorite part. And I'm still referring to those notes every single day mm-hmm. uh, or not every single day, but a lot of the time, because that was the core problem. There was this playbook that people were following. They were not seeing results. How can we improve that? How can we package that right. into a product? And so it's really started as a solution to my own problem. I realized I'd solved it. And the scale of the internet guarantees there are enough people out there who have a similar problem to you. So 
every single person watching this video or listening to this podcast is sitting on hundreds of thousands of dollars of product ideas. If you just right. look backwards at the two years that you solved and say, what would all the things that be valuable to myself two years ago? How can I write and create those things? Because the internet will do its job in putting those ideas in front of the people that it, they will be most helpful to. I love that. I love that so much. And the reason is, you know, even I think I f firmly believe in one thing, which is everybody should do things for themselves first. That's like the greatest start for anybody's career. Like, you know, especially like when, when you're into tech or when you're, when you want to become a creator, you have to do things for yourself because you're the first consumer and you have to be very selfish at it so that you keep doing things. You, you, you have something to look forward to. I think that triggers everything else. Like I built this thing called Shutter for myself and a couple of friends I have the same way you did ship 30 for yourself and a couple of friends you have a couple of followers you you know, you, you had on Twitter. Uh, and what was it like in the first initial days? You kind of validated with your 50 interviews, you know, you, you, you saw an opportunity and I'm sure that there would be there there are some there there would some would be some challenges that you faced, right? It's not like a, a rose bed. Once you opened like cohort two or cohort three, it was like, yeah, we want like you know we want to be part of it. You should have like you know went through some struggles. What were how did you handle them and what were those? So let's see. First cohort was November, and then the first paid cohort was uh, January 2021. That was 199 dollars. Mm -hmm. Number one thing was getting comfortable charging $199 for something on the internet. Talk about imposter mm -hmm. syndrome. Talk about all the stories I would tell myself about how I was unqualified, all of that. But right. there's power into leaning into that because I still remember waking up on New Year's Day. The cohort was starting at 2 p.m. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my goodness, 100 people are about to come in and they pay $200. This better be the best <laughs> experience ever. Right. And so I worked all night on creating a better curriculum, a better onboarding experience. And so it was leaning into my imposter syndrome and forcing that to make a high quality product. And I'm still doing that today. It's mm -hmm. 30 up to 699 now because we've added thousands of dollars to a value. Mm -hmm. But I still, every single person that comes in, I'm like, they paid hard earned money. How can I make this mm -hmm. the best experience possible? And I still feel uncomfortable about that sometimes. So it's a way of... Right. A very helpful way of designing a product is like, I want to do everything I can to make it an incredible experience for every single person. So that was one, I guess, problem that I had to solve. Another one was just learning how to run a course. I mean, yeah, Zapier, ConvertKit, emails, customer support. I mean, I did every single thing in those first couple of cohorts. Mm. So building the landing page, building the post-purchase emails, writing the email sequences, every single thing, it was just... There's no one else out there that's going to do this. I had to learn it. And right. there was no better way to learn it than to just do it. And that's right. how I overcame yeah, this. So just lack of confidence and lack of knowledge that I solved <laughs> with volume. So doing more of mm -hmm. the two things that I felt I didn't know and felt unqualified for ended up working out. How did you manage uh, the imposter syndrome? Like you were just started writing. And there were like legends and giants like David Perel's of the world. Like you're entering into like a very uh, high stakes world, right? Like it's not something like new, like Web3. It's like just getting started. Every Seth Gordon, like these these folks are like incredible writers who actually are very active on, on the internet, like sharing their ideas and you take Jack, Jack Butcher as, a, as an example as well. How did you handle the the imposter syndrome and what was like, what was your dialogue in your mind? Like, you know, every time you do certain things, you, and even till today, I feel like that the same way. Um, am, am, am I not qualified or do I have everything I have to do what I want to do? Right. How do you battle that dialogue in your mind? Uh, and I hope, you know, you, you I think you overcome it. I, I'm sure about it, but just want to curiously, uh, no, like what's your storyline look like? So here's the thing. You do not overcome it and it only gets more difficult, the bigger and larger your following, your audience, your business, all that. Here's the one line quote about imposter syndrome is that if you feel like an imposter, it means you're not being specific enough. 
And so what I mean by that, and I'll use the example mm -hmm. of there being other writing legends. I did not start a writing course saying, I'm going to help you become a legendary writer because I was not right. a legendary writer. What I was very mm -hmm. good at was building a consistent writing habit and learning what works and what didn't for writing every day for 30 days. And so the original mm -hmm. Ship 30 like tagline was just build a daily writing habit in 30 days. That was all I knew mm -hmm. how to do. I knew how to block time on your calendar. I knew how to generate ideas. I knew how to create an idea capture system. So I felt very little imposter syndrome for what I was actually helping people with because I wasn't claiming to be some expert guru. It was, here's what I know, here's what's worked for me, and I'm going to share it. People who feel like imposters are trying to talk about things that they haven't done or are trying right. to share or educate on something that they're not experts in. And the big realization here is that people actually don't want to learn from experts. They want to learn from the people one or two steps ahead of them, right? The way I remember mm. this is picture yourself back in, in third grade, right? In third grade, who were the coolest people on earth to you? It wasn't the eighth graders because they were in a completely different school. They were mm -hmm. way more people. They were bigger. They were just, you, you couldn't even relate to them on any kind of level. The most mm -hmm. interesting people in the world were the fourth graders, the people just one year ahead of you. Because what's the right. new teacher like? What is recess like? What's a longer recess like? The different lunchroom, all these different things, right? Small changes that right. that's what people are curious about. And so you don't have to be some kind of expert in any area. You just need to be a specific expert in the problems that you've solved and then solve them for the third graders behind you. Because the beauty mm. of the internet is we're all third graders. There are fourth graders we can learn from and there are second mm -hmm. graders we can teach and we're gonna continue to level up as we go. We're gonna learn from the people ahead of us, share for the people behind us. And you can kind of just repeat that cycle every single year. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think the the other thing I want to also add is, which I feel you, you can resonate with this. You're absolutely right. You don't have to, you have, you don't have to be the, your hero immediately or instantly. You have to be your peer. I think that's really important. Like ha becoming your own peer is quite a easy challenge to tackle than becoming the legend you all, you always admire for. And th there is also something like, there is a there is a sense of belonging when you re, when you resonate with your peer because the david perels are like thousand steps ahead of you but you're just getting started tagging along with a buddy who's also getting started but knows how to build ideas perfect because you have some commonality between yourself and that belong that that belonging actually is very important when when it comes to like you know uh building these communities i i really admire that uh, when, when, when I hear like, those are the basics and fundamentals in my opinion of community building, right? Like, and I absolutely love the tagline, which is you're not over promising. You're not like saying after 30 days, you're becoming the New York times bestseller author. <laughs> That's not the goal or the dream. The goal is to just build a habit. That's it. Like whatever you do after that, it's your own, like the fuel you have and whatnot. I, that's why I really love ships 30 for 30. Uh, and so no, talking about ship 30 for 30, you're still working back then. You were still, you have your full-time job, which is completely like, it, it, it actually is, is bon it makes me bonkers because that's not what you do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis at ship 30, right? Like that's completely different. That's out of the box. Like how you said, you're, you're becoming an, you're, you're a third grader in BlackRock, but you're aiming to be like an eighth grader with Ship 30 for 30. It's like a, two different schools. I know I, I can resonate with you because when I did everything I did, I still have like a full-time job and the context switching is very painful because you have to like adhere the rules and like whatnot there in your in your nine to five. How did you manage? Like what was what was your content switching uh, my framework like? So the real truth, and I like this question, but I, I don't know if everyone is always satisfied with the answer, but I woke up at 4.30 a.m. and worked from 4.30 to 8 o'clock on ship 30, did my full-time job at BlackRock till 6, ate dinner, and then worked from 7 to 10 for a year, all of 2020. And that was how I did it. I needed to make time. And so I sacrificed a lot during that year. Luckily, mm. there wasn't much to do in 2020, 
right? There was <laughs> couldn't really go out that much. People yeah. weren't doing much. I was at home, and so I didn't have people when I was at the office who'd be looking over my shoulder, all these different things. So, like, if I had a light day, I could spend more time on ship 30. If I had a heavy day, I know I could push it. But that was mm. it. I mean, I had to bring a level of effort that was uncommon if I wanted to achieve this result. And mm. is that going to work for everyone? Granted, I was a 24-year-old single dude living in a house where there wasn't much to do other than work and work out. And so that's what I did. And most people are never going to be fortunate enough to be in that situation. And I'm extremely grateful that I was. So I always right. kind of preface my routines and my systems and my habits with, look, habits. Mm -hmm. I don't have kids. I can't wait till I do. Right. I don't have a wife. I can't wait till I do. Right. All those things are coming down the line. But for now, I'm, right. I'm focused on myself, my business, my health, and I spend all my time on those things. I love that. I love that. And yeah, that is, that is how you hustle, right? You, you have to hustle your, your ass off to work on the things you really love, even though you have nine to five is, it can be an excuse. And a lot, lot, many people think like, I don't have time and there, there will never be a time. I have, I have a kid now and I'm doing this podcast because my intention is to actually build a conversation that might help one person. That's it. And I, I, I tried it fun. Like the way you, 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 you did like ship 30, right? And that is how people should be driven by their, by, by, by allocating time for themselves. Even if it's like half an hour, half an hour grows to one hour, one hour to two, two to three, three to four. Eventually, like it, like how you did, like it'll take over the whole thing. I love, I love that man. Like, you know, you're an absolute, uh, a, a mirror in a way. Like, you know, you did so many things I did and I, I'm, and I really love, uh, the way you did it more importantly and do you have this is like right off the bat like you know uh switching gears do you have like a vision board if if yes uh what would that look like and you want to share some like you know some things on it a vision board in the sense of where i'm trying to go in mm -hmm. the long term and so I, mm -hmm. I i like to think about kind of five areas of my life, health, wealth, relationships, experiences, and business. Those are the five ways I break down everything I do at any time I have a project um, list with all of those areas. And so I kind of mm -hmm. have a 25 year vision in all of those things. And mm -hmm. the that. way I kind of, I give it a name. That's what's more very powerful about it is I don't just have I want to be this, or I want this to happen or this to happen. I, I give it a name and I bring it from some of my inspirations. And so right. I end up following those because I wake up and it's like, how can I become a hybrid athlete today? So for my health, I'm always trying to focus on how I can mm -hmm. train yoga while also running, while also strength training, while also training my mind, my spirituality, all the, all those kind of things. So I just have, mm -hmm. I don't keep really many like annual goals or short-term things. I'm always just, I have a project list of things I'm working on. And then I have this vision right. of where I want to be when I'm 50. Extending that time horizon has been so helpful, so calming, lets me operate from abundance, knowing I'm going to be doing these things for a long time. I don't right. have to be in a rush. Um, but right. yeah, that's where my kind of vision. Now I'll tell you the only real short-term kind of vision I have is I want to open up a place called the shipyard, which is going to be a co-working space, nice. gym, cafe, events, event space, reception area. I don't know where it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to happen, but that's like, I want to build ship 30 and type share and all of these different businesses to support building this right. really kick-ass in-person mm. sanctuary. And so I, that's the I only, like, that. I, I downloaded Pinterest. I'd never downloaded Pinterest before, but it was just to keep ideas on <laughs> what the shipyard vibe is going to be. I'm like, taking pictures of different coffee shops that I'm in now. I'm like, Oh, that's right. cool. Or that vibe is nice. Or at different gyms. I'm like, Oh, that's going to go here. And it's been right. a fun way to like totally put my brain somewhere else of this is right. where it's heading. And so I'm like slowly crafting that uh, vision as I go. I love that. I love that. I think I'm, I'm, I'm manifesting and like manifesting abundance your way to like make it happen of course I, I love that name like shipyard is such a such a such a on brand point like you know you went from ship 30 to 30 and you now can be part of shipyard love that <laughs> so 
you're a big fan of you and I we both admire this legendary person called Jack Butcher you know we were both huge fans of his work his tweets and what not and i i remember you tweeting about uh build one sell twice his his course that actually helped you shape ship 30 30 strategy the way you executed things uh what are some like key lessons that you learned that you actually kind of identified after you you've implemented like right now like not you read or went through the course but exactly like you know where you are at like what are some things the key points that you want to add to ship bill bill once sell twice from a ship 30 30 standpoint yeah so i i wrote a thread on this about 2 years ago and yep. this was my way of um this is my way of distilling what i learned in from Jack's course. So I'm trying to find the Twitter thread right now. I don't know is he There you go. I got it. So as I took that course, I still remember Thanksgiving morning waking up and like having dinner at night, but taking 3 hours of the course in the morning and then when I finished dinner I went back to my room and like kept taking it. I just loved it. Something <laughs> clicked right away what Jack had created. Right. And mm-hmm. I was distilling everything I learned as a way to say I need to learn this. I need to to sketch this into my gray matter. So a couple of those ideas are the difference between equity and dividends. And so at the time mm-hmm. I was just writing and putting things out for free and I still do this and I still think about this where right. at any time I want to be building equity and you build equity with your brand and your relationships and your skills. And then every once in a while you can extract some dividends from that. And you always right. want to be operating in a surplus, right? You always want to be operating where I extract some dividends because we launch our course, I try to get people in and I send emails, mm-hmm. right? That's how we how we do this. But mm-hmm. 90% of the information in Ship 30 is out there for free. If you want to try and splice it all together, we give it away. And so I'm always thinking, how can I just give more free stuff away, build better mm-hmm. goodwill where when then a course comes around, people are like, you've given me so much free, you're offering me something to buy, now I want to buy it. It's mm-hmm. so much easier to operate that way. And so I'm always right. thinking is this building equity? Yes, let's keep doing it. And so that that was a key key lesson. I love that. Yeah, Jack's been uh in in his his courses are so on point and it can it can change a lot of mindset mindset shift for not just creators but for founders who are building platforms uh or SaaS products. So speaking about SaaS So you did this thing called type share. I I do remember I I think I have an uh, I have an idea why you build type share in the first place because uh so many of your essays were screenshotted in the notes app. <laughs> I remember they had when in the early days and not just you like so many people actually kind of inspired from you and they shared their their versions of these uh, screenshots. So how did how did the whole idea came into life and uh and i think you're you're hitting at what 30k mrr right now congrats on that that's that's a massive win right there what was the journey like being a creator being a community builder from that point to like being a founder product building that's all like a different like you know a uh, different vibe right there so i did not start type share um sam the founder reached out and said hey i built this like these look better than the notes app of pu- celebrities oh. making public apologies right and right. so it was he reached out and we're like this is awesome dude you're a talented designer you're a talented engineer let's build something together so we partnered oh with, i see uh sam and i sam and me and uh from there we've just been kind of improving and trying to create a writing platform and now i will say i was a computer science major and math major in college so i was not i didn't mm-hmm. do anything with so my background i always wanted to be a tech founder kind of thing and I'm, i'm i do not consider myself like a founder by any means i'm not like raising money <laughs> this is just a saas product that we think is awesome right. and so there's no labels right. there's no titles uh, there's no ego around that i think it's right. we're building something that we want to be able to write more effectively with how can we right. bridge the gap where we were helping all these people start writing but so many of them were wasting their time like do i use twitter or do i use linkedin do i 
Mm. Squarespace, Wix, where do I write? Do I use Notion, Rome, Notes, all these different decisions. It's like, none of that matters, right? right. You need to just start writing. And so the goal <laughs> of TypeShare is to eliminate the friction of beginning to write. So it's where you can generate ideas, templates, host your writing, publish all the platforms. We want to combine all those things into one seamless software product where there's no more friction. There's no more decisions. It's I sit down and write. And so there's no more mm. productive procrastination that I'm designing my blog and all, all that kind of stuff. Love that. Yeah. I'm a big fan and I'm a big fan of the design and it's so beautifully well-crafted product. One of the sauce products, like, you know, I really like, you know, uh, love it. And yeah, rooting for you, man. Big, big time right there. You, you, you briefly touched about procrastination and you've tweeted about many times, uh, about the concept, right? Like the methods. So what are some newly identified ways to avoid procrastination in your opinion? So I'll tell you a quick story on this one. And it's how I, I avoid procrastination. And it's, you need to kill your wants. And so mm -hmm. what I mean by that is anytime you find yourself saying, once I learn about this, or once I work slows down or once my my kid starts to grow up a little bit or once right. i quit this job then i'll start you need to immediately mm. take whatever it is on the back side of that then and you need to start it today because mm. for way too long i fell victim to once this note-taking system is perfect then i'll start writing or once <laughs> i read these three or four books then i'll feel more confident about putting my writing out there and instead, right. I think about this as grabbing a shitty rod and starting to fish. So right. the story here is there's two guys learning to fish. And right. one of them says, okay, I'm going to learn to fish. I'm going to go buy 15 fishing books. I'm going to buy the nicest boat. I'm going to buy a <laughs> carbon fiber rod. I'm going right. to charter a captain doing all this. And it takes right. him three or four months before he even goes and casts his first line. And then the other guy says, mm -hmm. oh, got to learn to fish. Here's a stick. Here's some rope. Here's some bait. I'm going down to the lake and I'm going to start to fish. And on the right. first day, he didn't catch anything. Second day, he's like, oh, maybe I'll try this spot. Oh, there's more fish here. Well, now they're not biting mm -hmm. my bait. I need a different bait, right? So he's iterating from day one. And by the time mm -hmm. the other guy who's preparing to fish the entire time gets to the lake to start fishing. The first guy's completely sucked it dry. He started a mm -hmm. restaurant to sell all the fish he's catching. He started an education company that helps other people learn how to fish. He's done right. dozens of other things, all because he started on day one instead of preparing to start. And so that right. framework is burnt into my brain or any time mm. I'm doing this with YouTube right now. My first, I've published eight YouTube videos over the last two weeks or mm -hmm. uh, two months. One a week. Mm -hmm. My first one is so, so horrible. And it's awesome. <laughs> it's a it's a loom video that like I recorded too small. So that. it's like this much of the screen and you can barely read it. And I'm like talking and I made a Twitter thread. I'm like, I'm making the thumbnail for this one. I'm on Canva. I'm like taking screenshots, right. trying to use it. And by my seventh video, I'm a hundred times better. Whereas right. I could have spent months like, what should my YouTube strategy be? How do I mm. talk to a camera? But instead, I was like, no ego, I'm hitting publish. And I got apps. Uh, there's a my fourth video. I swear I didn't blink the whole time. Right, and I realized right. why I was doing that. And I got roasted. The YouTube comments roasted me. And I watched the video back. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I didn't blink once. And now I learned how to talk to a camera. And I got a lot better in that one week after that. And so right. instead of thinking, once I'm ready to start, that time mm -hmm. never comes. Just grab a shitty rod and start fishing. Yeah, that that framework is you know spot on. I, I, I think procrastination is a procra perfectionists attract procrastination in a way, right? Like they they wanted to make it everything perfect. And I think to me, uh, the way I wo I avoid procrastination is I keep like zero expectations. The the way I want to do things, like anything from take this podcast. I woke up on a sunny day. I felt like, you know what? I'm listening to like many podcasts. Let me actually start one. And I, I think I DM'd you as, as the first guest, right? And that's it. 
I have no idea. I have no mic, nothing. I have like no camera set up. And this, this background is like, it's actually really good right now. It was like a shitty background. I changed my views and all that. I think having that zero expectations and nobody's going to listen. I'm just doing this for myself is, is one, one addition to avoid procrastination. And I think you, you also added one, one other thing, which is you just have to like start, like don't overthink, just, just take, take that one step action. And the beautiful example you said, with take, take a stick, take a rope, take a bait, you're done with fishing. That's it. And that's how I feel uh, many people should do it and love, love that framework. Uh, so you've, you've talked about many things, ship 30 type share. Uh, you're, you're big on habits too. Like I, I, I saw many of your threads talk about like your health habits, your writing habits, the, the, your sleep habits, you know, so on and so forth. And what are some bad habits you, you avoided in the last, I think one or two months and mm. replaced with a good habit. The number one habit I'm actively trying to break right now is comparing myself to other people. Mm. This is a, especially someone else's step nine when I'm on step three and right. I've been writing and creating on Twitter for two years now. Mm -hmm. And I'm comparing myself to people who've done it much longer. I'm comparing myself to people on YouTube who've made 500 videos when I've made seven. <laughs> and obviously they're going to be much better. And it's a good of way course. to continue leveling up where you, there's no such thing as kind of making it. You just find a new group of higher level people to compare yourself to. And then you get into mm -hmm. that group and you do it again. So big focus of mine into the new year is going to be focusing on how I can avoid comparing myself to other people and just playing my own game. So that's a big one right. that I'm focused on right now. And how, how are you like, how I want to dive a little deeper into that thought process, because again, you know, we're, we're all humans and it's, it's very natural that when we do, especially on, in, on the internet, everything we do is exposed to many people. And we also consume a lot of things other people do. And it's very natural for us to compare us with others, right? Like it, it's, it's not an intentional thing sometimes. What do you what 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 is something you do when you when that thought arises? Like you saw, for example, I'm just not not pointing names here, but let's say you saw David's David Perel's thread, right? Wrote this incredible article, and you wished, like, hey man, why why would I write you know, such a such an impactful article? So that thought comes to your mind, like for example, or take YouTube, Mr. Beast posted this, wow. Can I do that? How do you process from like that dialogue to like, you know what? Let me do my thing. It takes time. Be patient and all that. The number one thing is just extending the time horizon. I know that if I keep doing this for 20 years, I will get to every level that of someone else. And so that takes all the pressure off, right? Mm. I just slow down and say, Hey, I'm not there yet, but I will be if I just don't stop. Right. And so that, Ability to extend the time horizon with which you do your comparison, right? Of right. they started a lot earlier than me. Who? Let's right. see where we're at in 20 years, right? I'll probably mm -hmm. catch up. Maybe I'll pass them. Who cares? Whatever it is, I know that I will get to a better level over time. So let's focus on how I do that today and tomorrow and the next day. So it's just extending the time horizon is the easiest way. And yeah, uh, by no means am I very good at actually doing that. So uh, it's funny you mentioned tweets on habits and, and mindset and things like that. Like 95% of those are just reminders to myself of I'm trying to do hmm. this and build this. I need a way to kind of concisely understand it. So there's no perfect way, but the, the, I'd say in the last year, the number one lesson and realization is that extending the time horizon with which you do any kind of comparison or output or anything takes a lot of the pressure and stress off. I love that. Love that. Yeah. Time, times, times the enemy, you know, in a way, they, if you, if you time box yourself to achieve your goals in like two years, you'll, you'll go bonkers. <laughs> you mm -hmm. say like, I'm going, I'm here to like play 80 years, like the next eight years, I'm going to be in the space, no matter what that mm -hmm. changes a lot. Uh, so let's talk about your team. I know you, you have your co-founder, Nicholas, right? For Ship 30 mm -hmm. for 30. 
have Sam uh, for type share. It's such a small team and small team of like-minded folks. And how did you meet Nicholas number one? And what was like, why did you pick him? Of course, that's, that's my second question. And how did, how did such a small team operates in a, such a impactful, efficient way? What was your secret behind, uh, executing? So don't want to leave off Daniel. Daniel Bustamante is our head of automation who yep. is a big love, love. Uh, part of the team. And he was part of the original Ship 30 cohort and has been working with me ever since. And so it's me, mm-hmm. Cole, and Daniel. And then I have an assistant, Jamie, who's a rock star. And we have a YouTube editor now. We have um, Sam working on TypeShare, some engineers. The team has grown a little bit. But mm-hmm. it's all, we don't have any standing meetings. We don't have any real formulaic processes. It's we're still scrappy. We get the job done and we do it. And that's been the number one thing is that a lot of people are, they use like the number of employees or the number of meetings they have as some kind of indicator of success or progress. And instead we've just thrown that all out the window and said, let's just operate. Let's get what we need to do done. We don't, a lot of things are unfinished. A lot of things are unpolished. So that's how we operate. Now, how I was introduced to Cole is a great story. I was doing some work writing for someone who was buddies with Cole and he sent us this cold email that said subject line, introducing Cole and Dickie first line, not sure why, but I think you teach (laughs) me. I'll leave it to you from here. That was it. I got on a call with Cole and we clicked right away. We had very similar backgrounds. He played hockey. I played football and he was a professional bodybuilder. So we played sports at an interesting high level, but we also were very competitive gamers. He was a, legendary world of warcraft player i was a professional call of duty 4 player and speed cuber really? so we wow. had these like interesting obsessions that were very out but then converged on writing and he'd written the book the art and business of online writing which is the foundation for a lot of the frameworks in ship 30. so mm-hmm. right away he joined the january ship 30 cohort had so much fun and then i said look back to imposter syndrome he'd been writing since 2014 he was very good at this he'd written hundreds and hundreds of things he could educate mm-hmm. very well on the actual craft. I was right. good at the habit side and the business side. So we combined right. and said, now I'm not an imposter saying this is a writing course. that's going to help you become a better writer because I've working with one who can teach that and isn't an imposter. Mm-hmm. So that was how I was introduced to Cole, how we started partnering. And then Daniel was part of that original cohort and has been working with me ever since. So that's a team. We operate lean. It's one of our core values. And uh, yeah, it's been fun to, not have any kind of bureaucracy. We operate with right. tons of ownership and it's a lot of fun. I love that. Yeah. Shout out to everybody who's, uh, who's doing an incredible job on all things with you. So let's talk about Twitter. Like, <laughs> uh, you're, you're closing out to what, like 300 K followers. And I do remember you had like, like you said, you and I, we met back in 2020, uh, when you had like very, I, I don't, I don't remember exactly how many, but you did, definitely didn't have like this six figure, uh, followers. So question one, uh, when you wake up every day, what was it like? Do you feel pressurized or stressed that you have an amount of, I'm not saying from a vanity metric standpoint, like you have to create like these impressions and whatnot. That's all stupid to me, but you also have a responsibility in my opinion, right? Like not many, many, many of us, we, when we do such things on the internet, we feel responsible for the content we put in and we have fun at the same time, right? Like, do you feel like, uh, like stressed, like what should I put in, you know, today or tomorrow? Like what, what, what my, the people I follow, they have to, they, sometimes they look up to you and they, they follow you like, 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 you know, step to step. Uh, number two is how do you detach yourself from results? So do I feel a responsibility? If I start to feel that way, I know I've kind of taken a, a bad path, right? I'm still creating for myself. Now I think there's educational opportunities in that because anything that I learn, I know other people will find valuable. But if I wake up like, how am I going to deliver to people that are following me today? I'm likely operating from a place of ego where I think I'm more important than I am. Because as much as as 
I might have 300,000 followers, but every one of them are following other people. They're inspired by other people. Mm -hmm. Like by no means am I like the source for anyone. And there's still to this day, like I remind myself, there's no one on planet earth who is waking up. Like I can't wait to see what Dickie publishes today. As much (laughs) as I'd love for that to be the case, it's just not true. Even at this level of followers. And so that's been a good place Mm -hmm. to operate from. Um, what was the second question? Cause it, it tied into that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you detach yourself from results? Like you, you post something, you, you know, the expectations and how do you balance? Yeah. I mean, obviously it's easier said than done, but again, extend the time horizon. I'm going to write hundreds and hundreds of more things. If this one doesn't work, the next one probably might work. We'll see. But when you operate from this abundance of I'm going to write a ton. I'm going to meet a ton of people. Some things are going to work. Some things aren't. Everything's a learning opportunity. You just say, oh, that one didn't work. On to the next one. And the funny part about things that don't work, it just means Mm -hmm. not very many people saw it. And so it's Mm -hmm. ironic of like, that didn't work, but no one really knows it didn't work. Why stress out about it? On to the next thing. How can I improve? Right. Right. I love that. Yep. Uh, Man, a lot, lot, lot lot of the stress comes from like you know ego like you said it's 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 the absolute uh you know dream killer i would say so yeah i i, I know you're we're on time i'll be very mindful about both of our times but i do have a segment called rapid fire five which is like i, mm. I ask like five questions you know just shoot out whatever that comes to your mind uh who's your favorite writer on the internet derek sivers so I love Derek Sivers, uh, his conciseness, his marketing background, his approach to kind of solopreneurship, his approach to building businesses, his approach to improvement. And so I model a lot of my writing after him. Awesome. Uh, who's your favorite ship 30 for 30 student? <laughs> That's like picking children, man. I don't know if I can do that one, but I'll, I'll make this one easy and say it's Daniel because he was in the original ship 30 cohort and now works for oh. me full time. So, uh, <laughs> Daniel takes the cake on that one. Um, but I love the whole community. They're all great. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And I, I want to put you on spot, but you, you've cleverly managed right there. <laughs> uh, what's your recent, uh, favorite article or a blog post or, or a Twitter thread you read that you want to recommend to the, to the listeners? Uh, it's, I'm actually reflecting on this right now. And I, ironically, I've, I've read much less in the last year than I would have liked. I was going through some of my old blog posts, so I don't have anything very recent to recommend, but I'll I'll recommend a Lindy blog post that changed my life, which is six harsh truths that will make you a better person. Just give that a Google. I think it's crack.com. One of the best articles out there. Just read it, absorb it, put those harsh truths into practice. Highly recommend that one. Awesome. Uh, This is a personal question. What's your favorite favorite pastime with your mom? (laughs) Favorite pastime with my mom. Don't please don't please don't tell writing. <laughs> Mm-mm, no, definitely because that wasn't as much a pastime. My mom and I have always bonded over just cooking and making great dinners or breakfasts. So my favorite nice. thing now is when I'm home, going to breakfast with my mom, leaving my phone in the car, sitting in the sun, drinking coffee for the first hour, then having a delicious breakfast. We just catch up. It's always perfect so i look forward to those precious that. moments uh time and time again awesome last thing it's kind of like a, a serious question what's your end goal what's the end goal for dicky bush no end goal man the end goal is to keep playing everything so every area of my life i just want to keep i i know that there's a a vision on all of them of where i'm heading that is in unachievable right there's no outcome mm-hmm. with any of it because if I've learned anything, it's that reaching an outcome is not the goal. It's to enjoy the journey of Absolutely. pursuing that. So there's no end goal. The The end goal is to wake up every morning excited to build and uh, pursue that vision and mission and um, enjoy every step along the way because... Yeah, and have fun. Have fun. fun. You're, you're have, the, to, have, you're, have fun. Have to have fun. You have, you're the one, of, one, of the, one of those folks, prolific folks, I would say, who prefer fun or anything else. So... Man, this has been a blast, and I'm I'm sure the list, listeners are going to like take some of the gems you just dropped, and hopefully, like they implement in their life. Where should people find you? What do you have any closing thoughts? 
No, thanks for, if anything resonated, my Twitter DMs are open. I'm at Dickie Bush on Twitter, D-I-C-K-I-E-B-U-S-H. I'm sure you probably know that. Um, yep. If you want to learn more about starting to write online, you can go to startwritingonline.com, download our free 13,000 word ultimate guide that'll have everything you need to start building an audience in 2023. And if you want to put some of those ideas into practice and join the next Ship 30 cohort, you can go to ship30for30.com and check out the whole course. We start on January 1st. We'd love to have anyone listening or reading. And if you uh, have any questions, be sure to reach out, but it should be a fun kickstart to the year. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to put everything in the show notes and shout out for Dickie uh, for hopping on this part and shout out to all of you for tuning in for this episode. I'm your host again, Sharath. This has been a blast, Dickie. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate your time, man. Awesome. Thanks, Sharath. And keep it up with the pod. Excited to see what you do with it. Absolutely. Cheers, guys. Boom.